is the time where the where where issues let me just close that um, where global issues clearly impact us perhaps more than normally. So uh, I, I like to talk about the big picture. I hope uh, that um, you'll enjoy this. I do virtual presentations and physical presentations when it's allowed on a variety of subjects. I've been doing this for many years and I research and provide clients with uh, a fair amount of insight and analysis on both South African and international political and economic issues. Okay, perfect. I think, I mean, these conversations have obviously been extremely fiery over the past 12 months and more particularly with the pandemic. So to hear your insights and gauge sort of where we're heading and where we've come from is going to be a big help to us all. Uh, maybe you'll help us feel a little bit better, but maybe a little bit of anxiety. I don't know. <laughs> we'll wait to see what you have in store, but take it away, Daniel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. It's, it, it's lovely to be with you. It's, you know, that's one of the problems with, with this virtual platform is that, you know, there are a few faces I can see here, but I just can't see the rest of you. I can't see what you're doing. Maybe I don't want to see what you're doing, but it's just, it, 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 it's, it's lovely to be in. And, and I hope to just, you know, give you some updates as to where, you know, I see at least some of the global factors that are going to impact us and clearly some of the domestic South African factors as well. Uh, it's quite a big presentation. So, uh, you know, either we're going to write a three hour exam at the end of this, or else I'm going to give you a, a summary of this in PDF format in case you can't sleep at night and you want to look at some of my charts and graphs. I'm a charts and graphs guy. So, uh, you know, whatever I say, I like to have backed up at least by fact, because when you're dealing with sometimes controversial issues or sensitive issues, or particularly political issues, <laughs> not doesn't matter whether you're in South Africa or somewhere else, um, you really need to have, you know, your, the, the, the proof behind what you're saying. So, um, you know, I'll tell a story. The proof will be in the charts and the stats that I show on the side. Don't worry too much about the charts and the stats. Uh, rather listen to the story. But if you argue with me, I'll give you the uh, page reference uh, that uh, you can really uh, go, and, go and study. Uh, I've got a presentation and I'm going to share the screen now with you. Let's hope that all works and uh, is up on the screen. If uh, the slides don't uh, advance. Somebody will interrupt me and tell me. Hopefully you can all see me and hear me. And hopefully you can all see the title slide of the presentation, which I've called South Africa and the world. Will a V-shaped recovery hold? Uh, and we'll come back to the concept of a V-shaped recovery in a little bit. Uh, I, I think many of you probably know what a V-shaped recovery is, but if you don't, I'll explain it and I'll explain why there are question marks about whether both the world and South Africa can really uh, sustain uh, a V-shaped recovery into the future. So um, sit back and relax. I always think you need something strong for my presentations. I'm not sure if coffee or fruit juice will do, um, but as I can't see you, I won't tell at all what you do. Um, you wanna, you know, for an analyst like myself, and really doesn't matter whether you're an analyst or whether you're in business, you know, the last uh, you know, year, uh, 16 months, um, has clearly been uh, probably the most unusual time in any of our lives from a, from a macro perspective. Uh, you know, we all, we all go through hardships in family life, uh, personal tragedies, uh, difficulties, but uh, to think that everyone around the world has really been disrupted to the extent that it has uh, is really quite remarkable. And I think the fact that, uh, you, know, and I, you know, we've all run our businesses as best we can over this period. We all have to some degree um, adapted uh, to uh, the prevailing conditions. I suppose a testimony to the resilience of the human species. Some of us have adapted <laughs> somewhat more um, cleverly, I think, like in this particular uh, uh, image here on the screen. But we have all at least, you know, begun to operate in what we call a sort of that cliched new normal. It's going to change. It's shifting and changing as we speak. Um, and with a bit of luck over the course of the next few months, we will start to see um, a much better, uh, both global and I would argue also domestic environment occur. Now, we're not out of the woods at all, but uh, by way of beginning this presentation, I think it is important to note that uh, when we have a look at the broad uh, COVID situation globally, um, you know, I call it, you know, the beginnings of better, the beginnings of better. And if you have a look at the chart there at the bottom, you'll see the new COVID cases right up to date. This is from yesterday, right up to date. Um, you'll see that that sort of huge wave that uh, the whole world was engulfed in, including South Africa, from really the end of last year through to uh, now, April, May uh, of this year. That wave looks as though it's beginning to abate somewhat. Clearly, 
the issue of vaccines in the developed world has made a difference fairly clearly. I mean, the US at one point had nearly uh, three to 400,000 COVID cases, new COVID cases per day. Uh, the bulk of these new COVID cases now in the last month or so have been India. But even in India, we've seen the official figures and you, know, you can all argue about the unofficial figures, but the official figures have also come down substantially in India uh, in terms of new COVID cases. In fact, they've halved also from about 400,000 new cases a day to just about 200,000 cases that I saw in the last 24 hours. So the overall number of people globally getting infected looks as though at least as I sit here, uh, looks a little bit better. And clearly um, there are various factors involved with that, but the beginnings of the vaccine rollout globally and the advanced stage in some countries having a major impact. Now, the projections for the world economy as a result of the vaccine rollout uh, are certainly more rosy this time, uh, this time than they were last year. Uh, and you can just see on that particular chart how the global economic recovery, and I just need to move uh, some of uh, these Zoom faces from there. You can just see how uh, the global economic recovery, which is expected to be uh, in the region of 5% GDP for the whole world um, this year, a little bit lower next year, because this year you know, we come off a very low base from last year. So you see a much bigger jump this year, but uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. The, the chart shows quite clearly that in 2020, you can see that negative blue line, that negative blue line. So if you go from 2019, where there is this blue line there, we go right down to that bottom of that real negative GDP growth in 2019. And we go back up to what the world should see this year, which is just over a 5%. Uh, I can see somebody has raised their hand. I'm not sure if they need uh, to say anything or whether they can't see me. So, um, Stephen, I'm if, not sure if you can unmute yourself if you do have a comment or question. If there is a comment, if there's a technical issue, we'll take questions at the end, but if there's a technical sure. issue, do let me know. We'll do. Oh, Everything's going okay. Okay, I'm going to go okay. Um, so you can just see that, that from those from that, that 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 2019 period of growth to that deep low last year uh, of negative GDP growth to the expected pretty good recovery this year globally, there is essentially a V shape there. There's a V shape down. There's the point of the V at the lowest point last year, and there's a V shaped up. It ultimately then corresponds to what we call a V shaped recovery uh, for for the world. Um, all across all of the data that we look at, um, you can generally see an improvement in economic conditions. When you look at the number of uh, global markets that are um, expanding vis-a-vis -vis those that are contracting, on the left-hand graph, you'll see that um, the markets that are expanding or the countries that are showing expanding growth rates um, have now overtaken those that were contracting. There's the point towards the end of last year. And you can just see now that um, most of the global markets are now expanding and on an upward trajectory. Uh, and uh, fewer of them are clearly on a downward path as well. Global growth, therefore, uh, increasing. And again, you know, you, counter, you, you sort of counter check all of these things against all the different kind of measurements that we use. The big measurement that we all use is the Global Purchasing Managers Index, which really measures um, the forward orders of companies uh, in terms of the demand for goods and services. And again, you know, you can see all of the, the colorful lines on the charts. I love charts. I need to get out more. But if you look at all of these uh, charts, you'll see in general, we've seen that V-shaped, that V-shaped dip in last year as a result of the worst of the COVID bad pandemic. I mean, this is a good chart to indicate that V. Uh, and you've seen then the recovery in many, many regions of the world um, back uh, a little choppy, as you can see, uh, but still a, a reasonably good recovery going forward. Global exports are looking a lot better, also in a V-shaped recovery. And China as a country has really been, um, you know, leading the way in terms of getting its own exports back uh, and back relatively healthy, as you can see there. Um, at the end of that particular slide. Uh, globally as well, and I'm talking about globally and not one particular country. Uh, again, look at that V-shaped uh, index that we had uh, uh, from global sentiment or global consumer confidence. Terrible, of course, during the pandemic. As we've started to improve, consumer confidence has risen and gone up uh, quite substantially as well. Again, a V-shaped recovery there. So, you know, you get the idea that, you know, we have seen an amazing recovery. Um, now that's on the global macro front. 
in the United States in particular, of course, and there is the new President Biden, you can see him, by the way, in that picture, signing all of those executive orders. I mean, and he's been very busy trying to undo a fair amount of uh, the Donald Trump era, I might add. You've got a lot of signing to do when you've got to undo all of those Trump executive orders. And politically, I might add, because I'm in normal times in and out of the US quite a bit, uh, Mr. Biden must be careful that he doesn't become a little bit too quick to undo some of the Trump stuff because that American electorate is very divided and very polarized. Uh, so, uh, you know, you've got to steer you know, very, very carefully uh, in that political environment. But the good news from the United States and the good news for us globally is that the US economy also has picked up nicely. Again, you can see a V-shaped recovery there in that US GDP, um, which uh, is looking a lot better clearly than it was. Um, for the Americans, of course, they have benefited from the fact that the state has been able to dish out large cash payments to American citizens. And well, wouldn't we like that in this country where everyone, everyone in the US got uh, you know, a pretty handsome uh, handout from the government. Look, it, it, it's only the taxes that you've paid all those years coming back to you in small quantities. So it's not exactly a huge handout. But nevertheless, when you give people money, even if it is their own money that was taken from them in the first place, you do then uh, have an increase in uh, consumer sentiment and people are more likely to go out and spend. And the demand for goods and services has therefore been strong since the Americans have been able to spend money giving it back to their own citizens. Now, US spending is important from a global perspective just because it's such a powerful country. Uh, and as many of you know, the uh, Biden administration now wants to spend a massive amount of money, massive, uh, I mean, $4 trillion, $4 trillion uh, uh, on a partial uh, infrastructure plan and then in uh, social spending and support for American families. Now, this is a massive amount of money, even for the United States. And when you want to spend so much money, you inject a lot of cash into your system. Uh, this clearly can boost the economy. It gives people stuff to spend, money to spend. It produces infrastructure. So all of the stuff that goes into infrastructure, the engineering companies, the architects, uh, uh, the city planners, the, the local, local states, uh, metropolitan areas, the money flowing in will be quite substantial. Um, and obviously, uh, supporting families also takes some of the financial pressure off them. So you are seeing uh, this sort of recovery led by this massive US spend. Now, the, the, the spend hasn't yet been passed. Uh, there's a great degree of conflict in the United States between the Republicans and the Democrats on this issue. And many Republicans will argue that when you spend so much money, you overheat your economy, and that can lead to inflation down the line. So we are not quite sure exactly how much of this cash will be spent, but it probably will be relatively close to the $4 trillion. All of these factors would suggest that, uh, you know, are we then moving into a sort of post-COVID environment in which we'll all be singing and dancing, much like people were doing in the roaring 20s. That's the 1920s, and we are back now in the 2020s. How strange it is that 100 years later, uh, the world is also recovering from a global pandemic, the Spanish flu being the one back 100 years ago. But it's not going to be, uh, you know, as roaring as perhaps one might think it is. Um, uh, certainly, uh, if you're looking at uh, putting money into uh, foreign or U.S. equities, just beware that the U.S. stock market is really very, very high. It wasn't this high back in 1920, by the way. Um, so if you're expecting to make, make a huge of amount of money right now from U.S. equities, you may be a little bit disappointed. You're buying in when the market is very high. You also have to understand that whilst the world economy looks a little bit healthier, Governments have been borrowing money. They've been borrowing money and they've been printing money as well. That's how they funded uh, the global relief effort, uh, uh, the COVID funds. Uh, now, if you're going to borrow money and if you're going to print money, well, there's a lot of money going around, to put it simply. And again, the specter of inflation does rear its head as well. All of this debt, ultimately, <laughs> is going to have to be paid off somewhere down the line. And, you know, how is it going to be paid off? It will probably be paid off through rising tax rates and the cutting of tax perks, certainly in the United States and potentially in much of the Western world as well. And you've already seen the Brits, as it happens, warn in their last budget that uh, over the next few years, they will too see higher tax rates. 
Uh, Biden has also spoken about higher tax rates for the wealthy, not for the middle classes, but for the wealthy. And I do think that in the uh, developed world, that's going to be a feature over the next few years as we do have to recoup some of those losses during the COVID period. Inflationary pressure has mounted in the United States as a result of these factors, which is still a cause of concern. And there is some, I suppose, concern that um, the US might begin or at least uh, uh, sh shift their uh, policy on interest rates and push up the interest rates by the end of the year, perhaps relatively marginally. Now, you know, there's a great debate about whether this will happen or not. It is an important issue from a global perspective. If US interest rates go up, then our South African interest rates may also have to go up because we need to be relatively competitive uh, with the United States in terms of uh, a return on investment. Remember, if US interest rates go up, uh, investors are likely to keep their money in, in the US because they can get a reasonable rate of return. We've got to offer a better rate of return in South Africa to attract uh, foreign uh, funding into our country, which is critically important. So we've got to be competitive on the interest rate cycle. Uh, so it's really very important as to whether the US decides to hike the interest rates. Uh, the jury is out on whether this is likely to occur. I think interest rates are still relatively benign globally, although there is a spike in inflation that we've seen in the United States and here in South Africa that I'll come to in a moment. I don't think this is sufficient as yet to uh, concern ourselves with rising interest rates. But it's something that we all need to flag and all need to watch. All I do is, you know, let's sound the warning here that uh, we may be at a global low in terms of interest rates currently. And uh, it may well be that if inflation is not a temporary phenomenon, and it may be a temporary phenomenon as we come out of COVID, as our economies rebound, as there's a demand for goods and services just in the next few months, which will begin to taper off as we get used to a more stable post-COVID environment. If that's the case, I wouldn't worry about inflation. But um, if inflation uh, becomes a little more of a problem, then we may see our own rates hike accordingly. The United States economy, of course, has been strong, as I've indicated, but there's also enough data to show that uh, it also can disappoint on the downside. Uh, the last jobs report in the United States wasn't quite as rosy as was expected. Retail sales in the United States have been strong because of those handouts from Uncle Sam, but uh, it's a little off the boil in the last reporting period as well, a little bit more disappointing there. So I think, you know, I think we will watch all of these issues as we go forward. But for the moment, I think there is, you know, reasonable green shoots for the United States economy and clearly for the broader macro global economy as well. But I like this particular slide as an illustration for the second part of what I'm going to talk about on the global, on the global issues itself. You can see two, two plant pot containers there, both different sides of the world. Uh, uh, one is blossoming with a very large tree, and the other one on the right, and it's, you can see the map of Africa there in the plant, planter, I suppose, uh, that tree is wilting and not looking as healthy as the one on the left. Uh, I think what's important to understand about this recovery, this post-COVID recovery that we've seen, is that it's an uneven recovery. It's not the same everywhere. Uh, and uh, it's better in the developed economies of this world, but it is certainly not quite as exciting in many of the emerging market economies across this world. Some are better than others, as I will show you in a moment. Now, I think it's important to understand this distinction because the recovery of the world is not the same everywhere. Uh, and let me just show you here that um, you can just see in a bit of complex graph, and I don't normally go into too much detail about charts and graphs, but just take a look here. This dark blue line is what we call the advanced economies. Um, and you can just see that um, the pink line is, uh, well, let me just show you here, the one that I pr probably prefer to show you, is that the, the decline, the decline for the advanced economies in this world from the COVID years of 2020 to our sort of recovery year in part of 2021 to what hopefully will be a better year in 2022, the advanced economies, Western Europe, the United States, Japan, the losses in their economies are much less than the losses in low income developing economies or in emerging economies like ours. 
So it's a stronger performance. It's le fewer losses in their economy projected last year, this year certainly, and into 2022. And you can see in 2022 that it's going to take those emerging economies and the low income countries longer to recover than it will the advanced economies of this world. And that is a problem for the world in that essentially, I suppose that old adage, the rich get richer and the poor stay poorer for that but longer and can set them back. Having said that, when we look to see which countries are going to be the star performers again as we move out, hopefully of COVID or the worst of COVID, despite the negativity of India, there's still a good expectation that India is going to recover. I think this is a little bit over optimistic. These are the projections from the International Monetary Fund, uh, putting India at about 9% GDP growth. It's sort of like a, a, a dream for us, fantasy land for us in South Africa to see 9% uh, GDP growth. Uh, but China expected at about 8% or so. I think it's a little bit high, but nevertheless, you get the idea that uh, the, those big economies are likely to continue to grow. But if we look on the right hand side of this chart, you can see that um, there are many economies, and let me move that there. There are many smaller economies that are not going to grow uh, particularly well at all. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we are, is going to be generally um, at uh, what one would call pre-crisis levels. Uh, there's not going to be great stuff coming out of uh, uh, Brazil, um, parts of South America, and clearly parts of our subcontinent as well. The big help for the wealthy countries of this world was that they could get much more support from their governments. And you saw these big handouts in the US and across Western Europe, as I have mentioned, which helped citizens overcome the shock of COVID. And also, why have the developed countries done better? Because their consumers had built up more savings. Wealthier countries with higher GDPs per capita, higher personal income, means people generally have more savings. And when you've got more savings, well, you've got a cushion, you've got a kind of a trampoline that helps you bounce back in times of trouble. And I think you can just see, because we've highlighted there on these particular char charts, um, how uh, where South Africa is in terms, firstly, of uh, assistance from the government during the COVID period. Um, it wasn't the worst in the world by any stretch of the imagination, but it wasn't anywhere close to perhaps what would have really helped the country. And in particular, in terms of savings, by the way, you can also see how the more limited savings available to South Africans really were a, were, were a, a problem for them in trying to counter uh, the worst effects of COVID and the effects on their businesses for the last year or so. And that's really why we are seeing this divergence in the global recovery as well. Uh, the wealthier countries obviously have been able to sustain themselves better. The poorer countries simply haven't. Uh, unfortunately, and the bad news, at least in the short term, is that it's been the wealthier countries of the world that have been able to roll out their vaccine programs better. Now, you know, I shouldn't mention the V word. There's a lot of V words in this presentation from V-shaped -reco recovery to vaccines. Um, but if you have a look to see, and I you know, hate to sort of uh, uh, label South Africa on the bottom of the pile there, but you can just see South Africa performing pretty poorly when we look at the doses of the COVID-19 vaccine given per 100 residents. You can see who's really been good at this. Uh, the UK and the US being pretty, particularly good, South Africa being particularly poor, I might add. But, you know, we're in good or bad company. You know, it's not just South Africa where the rollout has been poor. Um, it's, it's astonishing when you look at how poor the rollout has been in Japan. And you really would expect a greater degree of efficiency within Japan. Uh, so, yeah, we can criticize our own. Uh, but in all fairness, Japan is uh, the controversy about vaccines in Japan is enormous. Uh, and even in Australia, where they don't really have a COVID problem, but they really do need to vaccinate, believe me, there's a, a lot of consternation about how slow that vaccination program has been there as well. So the point really I want to make, uh, you know, in the global section of this little presentation, is that you know we are in something of a of, of a V-shaped recovery, but the V-shaped recovery is not consistent to everybody everywhere. Those people who what one would call um, you know, professionals in industries that are important industries into the future with great recovery potential, industries in technology, in retail, in software services, those are the ones that have shown the greater recovery. You only have to look at the price of an Amazon share now 
You only have to see who's hiring. I mean, Amazon are hiring, you know, hundreds of thousands of new employees. The airline industry isn't, the hotel industry isn't, but Amazon is. Uh, those industries that have been most hard, uh, 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 most hard affected, uh, uh, affected, the travel, entertainment, hospitality, food services industries, those are the ones that really have not been able to sustain any great recovery until now. So there's been a V-shaped recovery in some industries. There's been, well, you could call it a kind of a K-shaped recovery. That's the upper part of the K and that's the lower part of the K. It's not a recovery, it's a K-shaped decline. And this puts it in a better perspective, uh, perhaps more broadly speaking, those who can withstand the worst of the COVID pandemic in terms of their qualifications and businesses that they are in, uh, perhaps those are professionals or in, as I say, businesses that uh, have been able to thrive over this period, they are on the upper slope of this recovery. Those that uh, are uh, need reskilling, who've been in lower types of uh, employment, um, manual labor in particular, aspects of the service industry, those who haven't gotten education, those are the ones who really have been affected the worst. Uh, so it really isn't, you know, it's an interesting, perhaps distressing in part, type of recovery that we are seeing, V-shaped in part, uh, K-shaped in part as well. And again, you know, I don't want to labor the point on all of these things, but again, if you have a look at this particular uh, chart, which, which sort of indicates the different regions of the world, um, uh, the dark blue little dots here indicate that global financial crisis that many of us suffered through in 2009 when compared to COVID-19 now. And overall, for the advanced economies of the world, they suffered much more. The economic data, the job losses, the hardship was much worse during the global financial crisis than it was during COVID-19. But for low-income countries, low-income countries, COVID-19 has been much worse in the global financial crisis. So it's rather interesting to have a, have a look at these two crises and compare them to the different regions of the world. Still, when we look forward now to this post COVID environment, we are going to see important changes in the world as to which countries are going to be the strongest. China is still expected to be the engine of economic growth over the next five years or so. In fact, about one fifth of all global growth to 2026 is going to come from China. The US will be, I suppose, second in terms of contributing to global growth. And India, hopefully, that will, a country that will be able to bounce back, one would hope from this particularly bad uh, second wave uh, of, of COVID, uh, will continue to be an important and third largest player in terms of contributing to global growth. Overall, overall, for all said and done, we still, when we look at the world, um, predict that uh, the uh, engine of growth for this planet is really going to shift and continue to shift to Asia. And all of the data indicates that from a growth perspective, the Asian economies led by China are going to be global leaders. Um, if they're not already, they certainly will be over the next five, 10, 15 and 20 years going forward. Really interesting world environment and the world environment in which there are all sorts of other threats, political threats as well, threats of instability. And for that new American president Biden, he also has to balance some of the global security issues that uh, can upend even the glossiest of predictions, relations with China and relations with Russia clearly are going to be the key focus along with many other uh, factors. Now, briefly, let me just move to our African continent and see what the effects have been uh, on us. I've indicated to you already that those low income countries in this world have been the ones to suffer more greatly or out of proportion to the wealthier Western countries. And again, we can just look at the data, the brand new data from the IMF. And it does show that in terms of global growth, uh, sub-Saharan Africa now is the uh, weakest of the growth regions across the world, down at the bottom there. And as you can see, uh, what we call emerging and developing Asia, and that would include China, um, and the US top the list for growth zones. But I'm afraid to say, uh, yeah, it's a tough one for sub-Saharan Africa. And again, we can just see those GDP forecasts uh, for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa looking uh, somewhat uh, uninspiring. Now, uh, again, the problem for Sub-Saharan Africa, or in fact, the problem for Africa as a whole, as you can see on this chart, is um, the vaccination program. And once again, it's not just South Africa, but when you look at even, even though I might add more people are actually being vaccinated in many other parts of the African continent, uh, there's been a very interesting new study done by The Economist, um, and they've put a sort of timeline 
on uh, at what point will uh, countries across the world, world get um, sufficient numbers of people vaccinated. I suppose you could refer to that as almost a kind of a vaccination herd immunity. And you can see that for most of Africa, they will be the real laggards in terms of getting a, a major vaccine rollout. Uh, most of Africa really not expected to have a complete uh, picture on the vaccination programs by uh, uh, as late as the first parts of 2023. Uh, even South Africa, the economists suggest that we won't really reach the sufficient levels uh, until sometime next year, which I suppose is not too surprising. But you can just see how um, the Western world in particular is a really interesting chart because it just shows you uh, this divergence and the inequality that the uh, different uh, vaccine programs have unleashed on a, a world that already suffers from inequality, uh, exacerbated by this uh, divergence in the vaccine rollouts. And uh, rather interesting, that's a bit scary when you look at this particular chart, but I think it does indicate that some regions will bounce back, others won't. And again, here, yeah, when we look at the measurements of GDP per capita uh, across the African continent, uh, well, you can see the pink line is for sub-Saharan Africa, low levels of GDP per capita, the rest of the world higher. So there you can definitely see that K-shaped recovery applying uh, to Africa, uh, whereas the V-shaped very often applies to um, the Western world. Still, it might sound a bit depressing, but when we look at the figures the other way, and you can look at figures anyway, I could show, show you, I could reverse every figure and I could show you, uh, you know, how all of these figures look a lot better. Just quickly, it's not a very clear chart here, but uh, some of those growth economies uh, on the African continent that were doing really well prior to COVID are likely to bounce back, certainly in statistical terms. Um, Kenya, of course, which had negative growth rates in 2020, negative. Kenya was a booming economy. I visited Kenya a number of times in the last 10 years. I mean, Nairobi looked like, you know, really a, a tremendous frontier city with um, a tremendous building, also improvements to infrastructure. Um, Kenya, negative growth last year, uh, but bouncing back this year, more or less. Botswana, terrible year last year, worse than South Africa, bouncing back. Rwanda, bouncing back. So um, there is a bounce back, st certainly statistically, uh, going forward. Mauritius, Mauritius, terrible year last year because simply it shut down and its big tourism industry couldn't operate at all. Some bounce back expected this year. And here for South Africa as well, terrible year, as you all know, a bounce back. But a bounce back really isn't, isn't, isn't necessarily sufficient it's more a statistical aberration because the last year was so hopeless. And we'll come back to that in South, in South Africa in a moment. Just finally on Africa, for all said and done, and for all the issues relating to recovery, the point one always wants to make about Africa to me is that it is still a, an astonishing continent. And it's an astonishing continent because there is a demographic explosion on this continent second to none. There are mouths to feed, goods to deliver, services to service. And that's where the market is. The market is in Lagos and Kinshasa, 20 million plus people in those two cities and uh, many other uh, sort of a huge urban centers across the African continent growing and mushrooming. So, uh, you know, I think one can be sort of perhaps a bit negative in the short term, but the long term is the provision of goods and services and, and improvement of infrastructure for these people are critical. And that to me is where the spend is. I'm doing some work for an industrial company uh, that sells huge uh, earth moving and industrial goods equipment and you know notwithstanding these short-term fluctuations on the african continent the view is that's an infrastructure that has to improve that's where money is going to be spent those are the people that need to be served and that's what's going to propel africa well into the future finally let me deal with the south african story as quickly as i can but there's never a quick uh, way to deal with south africa um well what an interesting time for us amidst the broader global issues. Uh, there's global issues to face, and of course, there are domestic issues to face as well. Clearly, we've survived the second wave in South Africa. It was tough on all of us, particularly over the various holiday periods. And unfortunately, we have now seen our better results of the uh, February-March period start to reverse. And uh, the seven-day average of new cases in South Africa Again, uh, looking uh, a little concerning uh, just in just about every single province. It would be my view that we are likely to see some sort of tightening of restrictions here. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there is, the jury is out as to whether we will see anywhere nearly as bad a third wave as we had a second wave in South Africa. And 
the more interesting theory was that um, you know we had this uh, South African variant that was particularly uh, virulent. Now, uh, where we've had a variant, uh, the notion goes that uh, a level of herd immunity will have been reached as a result of that variant resulting in so many cases. That could mean, therefore, that our third wave that we may well go into in some form or other, one would hope will be less uh, less dramatic than the previous ones. But look, you know, um, I'm a political economist guy. We all are expected to have a view on uh, on, 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 on medicine. Um, it's a bit like when we had the water crisis in Cape Town, I was expected to become a, a water expert. Um, I, 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 I'm not. Uh, I, I simply look at the available research, but I think we should be concerned and we should certainly be careful over the next period. The big issue for us clearly is the vaccine rollout in South Africa. You can see the positive effect on COVID cases in the United States as that vaccine rollout happened very, very efficiently. Um, and, you know, I don't need to prolong the issue here, but you've got to begin a much more concerted effort. There's got to be an urgency on this vaccine rollout in this country. It just seems as though the urgency hasn't been there. And again, when you look at the world figures and you can see the more heavily shaded green areas are the current levels of vaccination, the paler shade of green indicates weaker levels of vaccination. No surprise, therefore, that we down on the southern tip of Africa are looking as pale as we are. Now, what's also looking pale, unfortunately, is the South African economy. Um, our economy, of course, uh, was in deep contraction last year. We expect an improvement, though, again, off a low base. So I caution once again, uh, you know, government will say, well, we're going to grow at 3% this year. Look, it's not great because we were, we were minus 7% last year. So, uh, you know, we, we need to sort of put that into some degree of perspective. And that perspective really comes when we look at the projected growth rates for our economy over the next three to four years. Now, uh, these are not Daniel's figures. These are figures from government. This is from the uh, South African Reserve Bank. And you can see we are, ex we are expected to grow and, and to recover uh, to just over 3% GDP growth next year uh, from that terrible minus 7% last year. But the growth rates expected for the next few years are not sky high. In fact, they're lower than the expected growth rate next year. Uh, and that's because this is a reflection on that terrible year in 2020. We will move into a more stable growth pattern uh, over the next few years, but I'm afraid to say, and government admits it, it's not me being critical, it's really not good enough to grow at 2% in 2022, and frankly, 1.5% in 23 or 24. Those figures have got to be much higher. These figures have got to be really uh, northwards of 3% uh, to make a dent on uh, the employment position within our country. Um, our projected growth rates, therefore, for the next few years are generally low by global standards. You can see I've just highlighted us in relation to all of the other similar countries across the world, and we're not really showing uh, any signs of outperforming, if I might say, any of these other countries. Um, and again, government's figures, this is from National Treasury indicates that in terms of our overall economic output, our GDP levels, we are not likely to get back to that 2019 GDP level really until 2023 or early 2024. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't expect great things, neither is government expecting great things here. What we have to do in South Africa is increase our attractiveness for investment, inward investment. That's foreign investment coming in and South African companies putting their money where their mouth is in South Africa, not, not, not taking their money out, but in South Africa. And you can see also in this chart, and this is not a Daniel chart, this is a chart from the International Monetary Fund and the South African Reserve Bank, I might add. And in this chart, you can see how South Africa lags in terms of getting that investment that she so desperately needs. And you need confidence to get investment you need good governance, you need good policy to get investment. All of those issues still clearly eluding us at the moment, along with the vexed issue of unemployment in South Africa. If I had more hair on my head, which I don't at the moment, I would pull the remaining strands out in frustration that we've been unable really to make any kind of dent in this real problem. You know, for all said and done about South Africa, you really need to give, get people jobs. They don't have to be wonderful jobs, but they need to make people feel as though they are valuable to society 
and that people can contribute in broad ways to society. And you cannot have a position in South Africa where you have you know, over 50% of young South Africans unemployed. That's untenable across many different um, social measurements. So, you know, the, the negatives about South Africa clearly are there, and I, I don't want to dwell on them too much. I mean, it's worth mentioning, you know, our, we have high levels of debt in South Africa, as many other countries do, but uh, we've had to borrow money. You've seen suddenly we've borrowed money from international lending agencies, controversial as it is, in some form or other, we've got to pay that money back, or we've got to go cap in hand and get more money. We've got to cut the wage bill in South Africa. We know that the state continues to pay very high proportions of our budget away in relatively high wages. Our wages are amongst the highest in the world when compared to total GDP. And that has to be trimmed. And of course, we've become a country that has offered our poor and indigent uh, tremendous state um, social grants and benefits. And unfortunately, we haven't at the same time expanded the amount of people who are fully employed. So we've ended up giving more people handouts than having South Africans employed in formal employment. And when the number of social grant beneficiaries outnumber the amount of people employed, clearly you hit, you hit a major problem in terms of what you can afford as a country. So these are glaring issues that remain with us and only turning this economy around into a growth environment is really going to begin to dent some of these graphs that I've shown you. So the question remains, is there now, I've given you the bad news in a sense, is there some sort of light at the end of the tunnel? And look, it's really tough out there. Uh, the statistics came out this week in terms of business liquidations in South Africa, and they are up 55% uh, in the first four months of this year when compared to the first four months of 2020. And that first four months of 2020 doesn't even take into account the worst of COVID. I mean, that really set in in the next four months. So you can see how hard it is there, particularly for the small or medium-sized enterprise within South Africa. We have, though, we have, in all fairness, seen what I would call an uneven recovery in our domestic economy. And it's been led by that green line there on the chart that is our agricultural sector. We've had very good crops in South Africa. The maize crop in particular has been outstanding. And despite the policy uncertainty about land reform in South Africa, the agricultural sector has been B12 shine. And again, these figures are from the South African Reserve Bank and Stats SA, and you can just see the effects. Now, I've been talking about V-shaped recoveries. Yes, there are, is a V-shaped recovery. Um, in some of these, let me just put that there, in some of these sectors in South Africa, you can see in particular our manufacturing industry, which is that blue line. There it is at the bottom of the V last year. Here it has bounced back. It hasn't bounced back to where it was in 2019 by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly looking a little bit more V than it has been. Um, our, trade, our trade with the ex outside world, our export volumes have been very good. I'll come back to that in a moment. Our mining sector, very, very good. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, our electricity sector, need I remind you, um, not uh, particularly healthy at all. Um, but overall, you can see that in some industries, we have seen an improvement. Uh, now, uh, what also is potentially important for us is the concern that government has for this issue of um, the gap in South Africa between how much government spends and how much revenue it takes in. And that gap has been increasing. We've been spending much more there at that peak of the red than we have been receiving <laughs> in terms of uh, taxes as our economy has shrunk. Now, what you've got to do is you've got to decrease your expenditure and you've got to increase your revenue. And government has certainly in the last budget indicated that this is a front burner issue and that they had, their projections show that these uh, gaps between revenue and expenditure will begin to close. That's generally good news for us. It's also generally good news that our recovery is going to be based upon um, an infrastructure rollout in South Africa. Look, I, I hope I live long enough to see this infrastructure rollout. I've been hearing it for years, but um, the money is on the table. Let's see if it actually does help us recover. The big plus for South Africa in the last few months has been our ability to export commodities. We're a commodity rich country and the price of commodity has gone through the roof as this global recovery has taken root and we have received benefit from that. 
That is an important positive for us in South Africa. Clearly, it's been this blue bar here. All the metals that we have in this country, which are used in industrial production, that's where the growth for us has been. And is we have- Is that a or is it under column D? I can hear a voice. I hope uh, that's not a voice uh, telling me something's wrong. Um, uh, again, just to reiterate the point, there is good news for our exports in South Africa. The blue line indicates our exports have gone sky high as a result of the demand and improved prices for commodities. And we've imported less in South Africa. That's not really good news because it means our economy is very sluggish. And in fact, we need to import. We need to import heavy duty equipment so that we can build the infrastructure. <laughs> so we actually need both of those um, to go up. Uh, to go up. Uh, but nevertheless, our exports certainly looking a lot better. And as a result of all of this, we've seen the RAND currency look a lot stronger. And in fact, just in the last week, the RAND, and there is the RAND here, is one of the world's best performing emerging market uh, currencies. Good heavens, would you have said that a year ago? Probably not, but never underestimate the RAND, by the way. It'll surprise the best of us analysts. Still, there are issues to watch. We've got inflation creeping northwards, and we have to watch that to see whether that has an effect on our domestic interest rates as well. Again, once again, in line with global trends, I do expect our interest rates, at least this year, to remain relatively neutral. But inflation, if it persists, could mean an interest rate rise perhaps in the new year. But for the moment, I think uh, it's a neutral probably rest of the year. Uh, we're seeing a little more uh, action in terms of bank loans uh, going out into the business uh, world, which is good, coming off a very low base as well. Uh, those who are selling motor vehicles will, will also point to something of a V-shaped recovery there. And there's a little bit of life at long last in that sector. Our exports, as, I, as I've indicated, have been relatively good. And even for those in the retail sector, there has been a bounce back. Again, a bit of a V-shape. So in South Africa, you've seen, again, in part, a V-shaped recovery. Uh, even in South African equities, if you've been invested, um, our equities have performed particularly well, particularly on the commodity side of the equation. So yeah, it's not all bad news for our economy. Finally, finally, a little bit about South African politics, because uh, you can't go to, uh, you, can't, you can't leave here without um, one or two words about the soap opera intrigue that uh, is South Africa on a daily basis. It's been a very, very awkward and difficult first five months of this year for President Ramaphosa. Uh, he's had to confront numerous issues largely relating to corruption within his own political party. Um, and we have seen now the first, I suppose, um, real salvos fired as a result of the state capture uh, inquiry arrests. Uh, and of course, uh, the continued ongoing wonderful soap opera sagas that we see on a daily basis. I believe some people have given up uh, watching Generations and they just watched this particular episode. Um, the Zondo Commission has replaced our normal soap operas. Um, but the bottom line is that um, it's a difficult time for the ANC, probably the most difficult time for the party since 1994. Uh, we've seen a rise in factional tension within the party uh, and the factional tension uh, has been brought to a head as we speak uh, by of course the trial of Jacob Zuma and the suspension and pending uh, criminal investigation into the Secretary General uh, Ace Magashuli. Now, you know, you don't really need uh, that much to ignite a fire within the ANC. And when you've got these two big personalities working to ignite as big a fire as they can, you can imagine, imagine the instability within the ANC. This is a testing time for Ramaphosa. My own view on this is that both these two gentlemen have diminishing quantities of support within the ANC. They're not as strong as you would think. Zuma certainly is a former president. Magashuli is a different character altogether, but I think that uh, one should not simply assume that he has a massive support base that can really undermine the ANC in any great way going forward. I think for Mr. Ma Mr. Magashuli, he shot himself in the foot uh, when uh, he was suspended by uh, his own party uh, when he issued his own statement suspending Cyril Ramaphosa. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, everybody. Um, and I love this particular cartoon because just about everybody looks as though they're suspended uh, in this uh, Zapiro cartoon. I think it's harmed Mr. Magashuli, and the ANC, I think, will be looking to try and uh, find a, uh, a, a way for him uh, to exit uh, the party as it stands at the moment. Mr. Magashuli clearly has um, legs to continue to be politically active, 
but I think they are more limited than one might think. There's another headache brewing for President Ramaphosa. It's one thing to attack Mr. Magashuli, but there's a lot of stirrings of uh, potential uh, fraud allegations against uh, supporters of President Ramaphosa. Now, if you're going to act against your political enemy, like Mr. Magashuli, the question for our president is, is he going to act <laughs> against his supporters, those that he likes? Uh, and I think that's a more difficult issue for President Ramaphosa as investigations into uh, health-related and energy-related improprieties uh, continue in the short term. The ANC also is uh, finding it a little more difficult to uh, sort of be a purveyor of brown envelope politics as it was in the past. There are a lot more eyes out there watching. Uh, and there's an effort clearly by our president to clean up the act of the ANC. So it makes it more difficult to uh, cross the palms with silver, as the old saying goes. It also means that some of the ANC who've enjoyed this kind of politics in the past are less enthusiastic about the party going forward. But the big test for President Ramaphosa is whether we can have a successful vaccine uh, program within the country. And I think the cartoon does say it all, there are a lot of potholes along the way as we have experienced and are experiencing currently. This is a, a defining issue ultimately for President Ramaphosa and for all of the internal politics in the ANC, this might be the key issue. If the vaccine rollout gains steam, President Ramaphosa will take credit. If it gets uh, mired in potholes, then I think it's going to be quite difficult for the president and at local government elections, uh, the vaccine rollout could be the big issue. So they've got to get that right before October, assuming those elections are held. The other big political issue in South Africa is just how much money do you give state salaries? Uh, the state wage bill, as we've said, is enormous. And of course, the trade unions in that sector want uh, a decent wage remuneration package of which there ain't any money left from government side. It's a political issue that again can affect the ANC at the polls going forward. So you wouldn't want to be president of South Africa, everybody at this particular stage. Uh, there are just too many complex layers that the president now has to deal with, headed up, of course, on the issue of the COVID response in particular. But the ANC's internal dynamics and corruption, uh, ongoing corruption, continues just to be a drain. It points us towards a very exciting local government election uh, in October, assuming it is held then. If the COVID third wave is managed, we can hold morning, it. Morning. If, it's not, if it's not managed, then I think we may well see a, uh, a postponement uh, in that local government election campaign. But this is an election in which the big parties are going to be tested. It's not going to be easy for the ANC, nor is it going to be easy for the DA as well. There are a lot of smaller parties out there that are beginning to look attractive to segments and sectors of South African voters. There are newer players out there as well who are going to hive off some of the votes from, in this particular case, the DA, and I might add, Mr. Mashaba can take some votes from the ANC as well, particularly in those urban Gauteng areas where he's going to be active as well. And the smaller special interest parties, ethnic parties, independent candidates, of which there are going to be many, are going to siphon off votes from the bigger parties as well. So if you thought that the sort of multiplicity of South African parties was bad beforehand, boy oh boy, I think the big parties are the ones that are going to suffer the most when it comes to the local government elections. Finally, therefore, it's a fascinating environment in which to operate. The South African domestic story really requires attention on a variety of different fronts to get ourselves back on track. Uh, and I've just put up on the screen, you know, 12, uh, you know, checklist items, like a shopping list of what I would like to see government improve upon. I'm not going to go through all of these issues. But frankly, you know, you've really got to begin to have policy clarity in South Africa. You've really got to have partnerships between government and the private sector. You've really got to, you know, reform your telecom sector, oh, you know, improve your education, skills development. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, there's not one silver bullet here, but you really need confidence in government. You need a capable state, a capable state that also embraces a capable private sector. If you get that right, broadly speaking, you can begin to make progress on many of these issues. I do though believe that this ultimately from a South African and global perspective 
uh, from what all I talk about is really a year in which the vaccines are going to be paramount in all of our lives. Uh, for all of the issues of domestic ANC hassles, this economy and the global economy will be predicated upon the vaccine rollout. We are behind the curve in South Africa. Africa is behind the curve globally as well. It is imperative, therefore, that that gets the priority is that's needed. We are already a country where there's huge inequality. In relations to the outside world, Africa already is in an unequal position. So if I might end on this note, I do think that this is the critical issue, not just for us domestically in South Africa, not just for African governments, but it's the critical issue for international governments to understand. The pandemic will not go away if the developed world is not vaccinated timelessly as well. And I might add, global growth will not take off unless there is good growth in emerging and low income economies as well, because what happens in Africa affects the rest of the world as well. What happens in Brazil, Latin America, Central America affects the rest of the world as well, as we've seen. So we all locked into a puzzle dependent on one another to get this thing right. I think that the track is correct. I do though think that it's a rough ride going forward, but it is, I think, the beginnings of better as I sit here with you today. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Goodness, that was a, a really information packed hour, but very enlightening information um, and things that we needed to hear. So thank you so much for putting together such a wonderful presentation. Um, we are up on the hour, so perhaps maybe if there are any questions that you'd like to put in the chat, if we don't get to them in the next sort of five to 10 minutes, uh, you might just email us at I2 and we can transmit the questions on to Daniel. Uh, but if you can hang around for a little bit, uh, that would also be great. Um, on my side, I would say that, you know, it was, you did say in the beginning that you're a charts driven guy, fully into your analytics and everything like that, um, which is actually really heartening and reassuring for me to see because we're dealing with the facts and we're dealing with the raw data. I think one of the more pervasive issues that we've dealt with over the past 15 months is um, dealing with sort of disinformation and, you know, to use Donald Trump's favorite word, fake news <laughs> and conspiracies and the like. Where would you suggest that we actually get information like this um, from verifiable sources? How can we see the work that you put out there um, so succinctly for all of us to, to engage with? Um, how would you say that we can you know, keep track of what's happening in the economic and political environment? You know, it's such an interesting question. And it's what, I don't often get asked a question like that. And it's so, it's so important um, that you know, all of you consult a, a multiplicity of sources in, 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 in assessing the information that you take in. Um, I cull information from a variety of sources. Now, I might not agree with all of them. I might find some of them ideologically incompatible to my own views, but I do like to cross-reference. It's very important to cross-reference. So uh, I, I, I do think that, you know, we are all blessed with uh, the internet uh, and we are all blessed with having the ability now to really read from a variety of sources you can go to any one of the big picture research houses and you can cross-reference. I like looking at information from the International Monetary Fund. I like the Economist magazine. Uh, the United Nations provide very good background information sources as well. Everybody everywhere has got access. So, um, you know, don't get bogged down on one source of information is all I can say, but really try and make the effort to look at different sources. But I suppose, you know, to be perfectly honest, that's why people get me in to talk. Because uh, you know, I do cross-reference. I spend my life looking at these charts and looking to see whether one supports the other. Um, and in some cases, they don't. I have to say, in some cases, one could. And you know, if we had longer in this discussion, you know, you could pick up on some of the facts, um, and one could say, well, you know, you show statistics in one context. We could put the statistics in another context, and it would perhaps highlight something completely different. Um, I go fairly mainstream with what I do. But I do think it's important that all of us really, um, you know, just, just make ourselves aware of those differing sources that are available. If anybody wants any information on it, um, as I say, I'm very happy to give you the uh, graphs from this presentation. Uh, and in it, you'll see um, the sources. Just on the, on the South African stuff, I must tell you, government is putting out very good stuff. Um, the Treasury, uh, Treasury, the South African Reserve Bank, putting out very, very good stuff. Um, so even if one gets skeptical about an analyst who may have a particular view, go to see what National Treasury are putting out. 
And I believe that the information is very balanced and really does show a very true picture of South Africa. Wonderful. Information is power. So I hope that everyone can actually engage with it um, in a meaningful way. Um, we had a question uh, earlier to ask, do you think the election will go ahead? You did speak about the local um, elections, the possibility of COVID sort of hampering that. In your view, do you think they'll go ahead? My view at the moment is that the elections will go ahead. Um, as I say, if the, if the uh, COVID case numbers rise dramatically uh, and if they continue to rise over that uh, June, July, August period, that would be normally a campaigning period, there will be a compelling case that as parties cannot campaign normally, uh, we cannot really go ahead with the election. That would be unfortunate in my view uh, because uh, South Africans really are owed uh, an election. Um, there is also a political factor here. It is possible that some political parties who are not ready or are fearful of a less than satisfactory election result uh, will want to postpone the election. So I think it's a, there's, a, there's a, both a health and a political factor uh, in assessing whether these uh, votes will go ahead. But you know, as I, as I, you know, if we can keep this third wave relatively manageable, at relatively manageable levels, then there's every good reason why we should be able to manage a local government election. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the last ones, um, we've got a question from Ernst. What's uh, your opinion on whistleblowers being portrayed as corrupt in the ANC and the whole witch hunt just being a smokescreen? Well, whistleblowers have been you know, incredibly important in uncovering uh, much of what we now know as a result of the, the Gupta Gate issues in the last number of years. Uh, whistleblowers ultimately need to be protected um, but I can tell you across the world, uh, ruling or governing political parties uh, are clearly never that sympathetic to the issue of whistleblowers. They always effectively uh, become uh, victimized or delegitimized in some way or other. What's interesting in terms of your question was something that President Ramaphosa just said uh, when he gave uh, evidence at the Zondo Commission a few weeks ago, and he's due back, by the way, in, a, in about a week's time. Um, but uh, what he said there was he, he, he was particularly praiseworthy, that's a word, of the press in South Africa. In fact, he made a, he sort of repeatedly ad nauseum spoke about how important it was for the press to uncover uh, all of the wrongs that uh, we now know have occurred here. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, internally, political parties will attempt to silence whistleblowers. On the other hand, the conduits that whistleblowers have into both the print media and more relevant today, electronic media and online sources is so great that I do think it's much more difficult for governments to hide. Um, and, and you've only just seen in the last day or so these latest round of allegations that have surfaced about uh, uh, procurement uh, issues and uh, contract, inflated contract issues um, under the uh, Ministry of Health uh, controversies really have been largely as a result of exposés, again, in the media, as a result of whistleblowers. You've yes. seen News 24's expose on the ESCOM shenanigans in the last week or so, again, as a result of whistleblowers. So, uh, you know, governments will try and hide this. Governments will try and uh, 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 denigrate whistleblowers. But frankly, I think it's like putting your finger in a, in a dike. Uh, the flow of water or the flow of information is now so great that no matter what you try and do, what you try and say, we're going to get more of it. And of course, that's not a bad thing at all. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I think we're running just a bit over time, but we haven't got any more questions in the chat. As I said, please feel free to mail us. We'll transmit your, your questions uh, along. But excellent, Daniel. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, hopefully, we can sort of move this conversation forward in a constructive way in terms of our environment uh, in the insurance world as it was an insurance-based uh, audience that you had here today. So we'll all keep our fingers crossed <laughs> as to where we're headed in this next phase, um, this very challenging, very interesting, very ever-changing phase. Um, as you said, it's a bit of a soap opera. I often, I often tease my dad that him watching the Zondo Commission is his version of keeping up with the Kardashians. So it's been, <laughs> it's been extremely entertaining and a lot more to come, but we appreciate you. Where can we reach you if um, you'd like to engage with your con uh, content, content rather? Yes, absolutely. You're very happy to uh, email me directly. Uh, find me on LinkedIn if you are a LinkedIn person. Uh, and my website is uh, danielsilkglobal.com. Uh, and also I do tweet uh, occasionally. So it's at Daniel Silk on Twitter as well. Perfect. Thank you so much.
Um, and to everyone else still on the call, we also still have a, a competition running, remember, for Justin's 40th birthday. We've added the link to the chat if you and your team would still like to enter. Please do support and engage with us on that one. And there'll be more information on that on our social pages. The search for I2 Special Risks on, on, on Facebook and I2 Experts on Instagram and Twitter as well. Thank you all for joining us again and uh, hopefully see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. everyone. And thanks, Daniel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pleasure Daniel. You. Thank, Thank you very much. Wonderful so great. session. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you, Daniel. That was yeah. awesome. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thank you.